first six of the candidates. Um, it was an exciting round. We had some great, interesting results. So the first game, uh, Jan versus Fabiano. <clears throat> They're both leaders, nothing to risk for too much. We play a quiet game. Jan actually plays four knights to make sure he stays in the lead after the first um, round. Not round, like after the first stage of the candidates. Yeah, he is like sole leader of the tournament. So he's in good shape. And uh, four knights is very, very solid. Fabi, I think, is also pretty happy to draw with black because that leaves him a chance to win with white. Um, they play main line, and bishop g4 now is sort of uh, one of the main moves. cd5 is an old main line, but bishop g4 is like uh, recently, um, recently discovered modern chess line, so displays the spirit of modern chess perfectly. So white plays bishop g5, tries to transpose the game into the old line, because if you take on d5, there's a check, take on c3, take, take, and it's considered to be uh, almost equal completely, because black takes on c6, bishop g6, trace everything, it's just, uh, white has a very, very uh, minimal advantage, if any, so that's why he plays bishop g5. And after all these trades, uh, the whole point is that if black plays queen d4, takes the knight, there's this discovered check, so the knight is protected. So after knight d5, black plays queen b2, and um, this is all theory pretty much. Fabi displays that he knows the theory, he has actually at the moment a pair of bishops. Um, the computer says f4, full path here and then attacking the bishop, grabbing the pawn, but in reality it's absolutely nothing. So that's why Napa just plays rook e1, um, gets the rook with the tempo, queen e2, the idea is to play queen e4, uh, trade this bishop because black will have to play bishop g6, and that's pretty much just completely equal game. White successfully managed to make a draw that he wanted, and um, he gets uh, today's game. Um, and we'll get to that, and this game is pretty just Grandmaster stuff. Grandmaster is doing Grandmaster things, um, repeating the position, and making a draw. Yeah, just no chance at all for anybody to win this game. All right, so now next we go on to this game. This was pretty exciting game. Naka plays Sicilian, but he plays G6. Very, very... A smart choice. The reason is that this is such an offbeat line, and it's actually not that bad um, among the offbeat lines, but it's pretty much way off the radar of the main lines in the Sicilian. So uh, he can easily prepare this line and avoid opening uh, opponent's prep, and also this line sidesteps a lot of. Um, Possibilities uh, for white, so it kind of narrows down the preparation. So this is a pretty smart choice. Uh, Gukish plays c3, responds with a cautious approach. Um, I suspect that d4 probably runs into some Naka prep here. I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'll be very curious to know what it is. And also, of course, c4 is uh, considered to be also the main line, yeah because it pretty much forces the game into the Marissa Bind Pawn structure. Unless you play like Morizia H did against me like a long time ago, he played something like d6, goes to bishop g4, you know, tr transposing to the Benoni King's Indian type of structures. So c4, I think, is um, pretty much, you know, the challenging move. But c3, you know, just going for the center is considered to be a little bit better for white d5, main line. Now e5 is extremely rare. I think uh, the idea is here is uh, to close the bishop and go for the pawn structure, but it's kind of weird because the exactly the same strategy was employed by Nakamura himself versus Kramnik in the Olympiad, where I was present on the board too. And uh, he, while Naka did get into worse position, he won the game. Okay. So, but the whole point of this, uh, the, this move, uh, the, the main move, of course, is to take on d5, and uh, there are some mind-boggling complications here. 
and um, some lines with knight a3, bishop c4, crazy stuff. Apparently, uh, white is doing a little bit better here, but again, I don't know this line, so I can't tell you. Uh, but I do know that this is the main line. Um, and the e5 line is reminds me of this recent Karakan idea where white goes um, t3, knight f3, and then when black plays g6, suddenly white goes e5, d4, and grabs the center. So the, the whole point is that um, white thinks that uh, the pawn chain, pawn e5, pawn d4, will close the bishop on g7, neutralize him, and uh, make black... Uh, play f6, some opening risky moves in order to free that bishop. So let's see what Nakaga does. He plays bishop g4. Um, again, not only this move frees the French bishop before black plays e6, but also white, uh, black sort of immediately um, hits this guy. So, um, so bishop d5 check. Um, I think d4 was also pretty okay. I mean, if we look at the engine evaluation, engine is not impressed with black crap here, but um, in terms of a human play, I think uh, this is pretty interesting stuff, especially if you're not prepared. It's not very likely that you're gonna go into the main line, main preparation line of your opponent. So bishop b5 check is reasonable. And the idea is that if black plays bishop d7, then this bishop g4 is a waste of time, but obviously black's gonna play knight c6. And then we get transposition into the uh, Russell Limo lines where white goes d4, knight d2, and then... Um, but it's considered to be pretty good for black. The, the only difference is that knight is on e4, and uh, black tries to go f6, c5, sometimes even sacrificing this knight to get the pawn chain. Yeah, some, again, some old, crazy main lines. Um, I, I don't think bishop c6 was really that necessary. Queen b6 is not a threat yet. But I guess he wanted just to make sure black is stuck with this weakness. Um, castles first. Still not sure where the spawn goes. Maybe to d3, but uh, it should go to d4, of course. And c4. Um, yeah, so the big question is, um, if you play d4 here, before allowing black to play c4, um, then there is a possibility that after a grab here, you know, white will, white will have some problems protecting the spawn, like, yeah, even after knight h6. Because uh, white will have to play knight d2, knight b3, uh, cementing the square, also protecting the spawn. But as you can see, uh, after this, and uh, a5 maybe even, right, trying to uh, catch this guy off the balance. Yeah, black looks uh, actually pretty okay. And he might actually play e6, h5, and this is pretty good French for black. Because white is stuck with the bad bishop. So, um, yeah, so that makes sense. So he castles, black plays c4, apparently it's a novelty. The idea is to stop d4. Uh, so d3, but then black manages to trade, and now his pawn structure is more or less okay. And let's see, bishop g7, queen e2 is reasonable. Yeah, white kind of needs to play f4, bishop e3, knight d2, and then set up the blockade on this square and cement this weakness. This is not so easy. Rook e1. Um, yeah, again, f4 is also a possibility, uh, but I, I think Kukir doesn't want to commit himself yet. And after this move, again, b4 looks very, very strong. Uh, while the pawns are on the dark squares, the color of your bishop, which in channel is not a good idea, but you white managed to get the knight on b3 and then cement both of these weaknesses and then finish the development like bishop here. Then the control over these um, weak uh, pawns and these squares sort of overweights uh, the, um, the pressure that uh, black can provide with this bishop. So knight e7, knight here, the threat is knight b3. So yeah, I'm a little bit surprised with this knight c8 move. Um, yeah, I think black should actually play c5 or maybe even a5 here, but a, the problem with a5 is that after a4, white plays knight b3, forces the trade, which actually opens the file for the rook to attack the pawn, and white gets the pass pawn on the a file. Yeah, but c5 looks very reasonable. Um, yeah, c5 looks very really reasonable. There are some lines where, you know, black plays like this, queen d7 or queen c6. Okay, but we had to see queen d7 move, yeah. This is not so easy. 
Uh, why is queen c6 not so great? Because after this trade, uh, the spawn is not so easy to recapture. Yeah? Uh, white plays knight here, f4, bishop here, and, the bishop, and because the bishop is here, not hitting this guy, uh, the spawn will be very hard to win, and then white will play c4. Yeah. But queen d7 apparently is better. But okay, knight c8. Black also has a plan. This knight goes to d7 actually. Hit this guy, take the square under control. Uh, and this is the big mistake by Gukish. Um, he really needed apparently to play a4. If you play knight b3 after knight b6, um, f4. White just needs one more move to put the bishop in the center. But knight c4, yeah. And with bishop e3, you can probably even take this bishop and castle, and then yeah, black goes for f6, opens the bishop, and it's not easy for white to uh, claim advantage because all his pawns are potential targets. Yeah. I mean the computer doesn't even care, he he just castles here, allows the bishop to get into d4, then he goes for this line where black simply repositions his pieces, protects all his weaknesses, and there is no points of entry. Again, the bishop is pretty dumb. He operates within confines of his own pawn chain. Uh, this square in c5 is the only asset that white has, but it's, again, not easily converted into something. The only thing I can think of is white plays knight c5 and then goes, prepares g4, five break, thanks to this close center. But that would be very double-edged. Um, but I think that's still possible, yeah. So that would be something uh, I expected. Um, also, a4 is very interesting. Um, very interesting because you need to play knight b6, so white stops the transfer. And then knight goes here. And now knight f3, okay. And the idea is that um, white wants to play c4 thanks to the spawn chain. He is going to play c4 and b5 and try to create the pass pawn outside. While black bishop is kind of stuck here, so c4 is critical, critical moment. Because if black plays c5, you can still play c4. Uh, d4, b5, this pawn structure looks like, you know, both sides have pass pawn, so what, yeah? But this is far pass pawn. It's a little bit more dangerous. This pawn is easily uh, blocked. But this pawn will be a problem, okay? So all the endgames are worse for black. So this was a pretty interesting moment. Uh, Kukish plays c4, and uh, he probably wants to trade here and do the same thing. Open the a file, push the pawns. But it's not exactly the same. Um, yeah, there was an interesting idea to put the knight on t5, but okay, a5 I like. And a3 is way too passive, yeah? It's way too passive. Uh, b5 was probably correct. After a3, now it's for certain that black's plays for an advantage. Uh, because black got rid of his weakness. Again, all white pawns are targetable. And uh, passive bishop. And black has potential. A uh, great square for the knight. Uh, he takes first and takes here. Um, so instead of doing this, knight e7 first was uh, pretty interesting. I guess the reason he didn't play it because he thought that maybe c5 might be dangerous. And then if uh, white gets knight here, bishop here, there's some pawn breaks. But in reality, it's not that dangerous, even because if there's pawn break, the knight can always go to c6. Yeah, Still, it, it is a concern for sure. Uh, maybe he didn't want to allow bishop to get to c5. Um, there is that possibility also. But then if you take with the rook here, knight f5, then this pawn is kind of weak, yeah? Bishop here. And you can't even play this because of bishop b5. Ah, so no time. Actually, no time. So this is tactical consideration. All right, but Naka takes takes. Again, plays very solidly. Takes on c4. This, this move order guarantees that black has advantage. Very, very slight. Again, thanks to these pawns being targetable attackable and um, white just wants to make a draw i guess yeah but this is very dangerous because um if you play for a draw like this uh, and black slowly improves he has plenty of opportunities to improve his position rook here queen here um 
it, it is kind of dangerous for white. He can easily end up in a worse position and slowly get outplayed. If you play for a draw, you tend to play passive and that gives your opponent chances and uh, that always creates uh, opportunity for the more aggressive player to win the game. So just repeating the position, I guess. H4 closing the file. Uh, Naka repeats the moves, testing his opponent, what his opponent wants. And apparently, yeah, but I don't like rook b5, yeah, I don't like this. Um, but okay, Naka is also very, very careful. Yeah, he plays black, he is pretty happy to make a draw. Queen controls all the entry points for the rook. Rook is beautiful, black is very safe. So he's gonna find the, probably the plan to win this, so he plays like this, and eventually they just repeat this, and it's a draw. All right, solid performance. Gukesh was a little bit too passive. I thought, you know, Naka would take some of his chances. But uh, if you can see, Gukesh actually didn't get into the time trouble. He kept everything solid, played fast, and um, it's a draw. All right, then we get to this uh, uh, game between uh, Vidit and Alriza. Vidit, actually, if we look at the results, this is Vidit's, um, uh, okay, I, I think Vidit is back at either plus one or 50% actually. Vidit is at 50%, okay. All right, so Alarza helped him get back into the 50%. Um, yeah, obviously Vidit's prep here in this game was better, I think, even though Alarza plays this Rouser. But the, the fact that you have to play Rouser says that, you know, you're going to take risk playing this system. Uh, the very famous game here was Fabiano Corano's uh, last round candidates uh, game versus Kariakin. Uh, that's where uh, Fabio lost that game and uh, Kriakin went on to play the World Chess Championship match against Magnus Carlsen, right? So, yeah, playing with black for a win is uh, very double-edged and actually carries significant risks because you're, you're, you're worse and then you're trying to play for a win, yeah? Yeah. Um, so, but we have this queen d6 line. It's been utilized by many top grandmasters in the past. Uh, Black tries to get the game into the Chevain again. Um, he wants to attack this bishop. Um, kind of avoided the English attack system, okay, which is very popular against uh, all carries attack, right? So let's see. Bishop f4 is kind of unusual. I, uh, but I do remember Kramnik played some games here, like in the when was it? Probably the 90s. Yeah, this, this was pretty popular, actually. I really don't like this move. Uh, like, they don't play this, you know. Kramik played 95 here, and Black was absolutely okay. Yeah, you don't play Queen d8 here. Queen d8 is definitely not a good move. Like, Queen should always go to c7. First you play a6, then Queen c7. But you protect this pawn by playing 95. If, if, if you think that this knight is going to fall for a 4, it's really no big deal. Also, Gelfand played like this, yeah? Bishop b3, queen c7, knight b5. It's just uh, queen b8. Here, uh, knight go back. Then a6 or b6. Um, I think Gelfand prefers to play b6, not playing a6. Because b6, uh, a6 is kind of a committing move. Um, yeah, so th this is very double-edged, okay? This is also h1. But Alreza playing uh, queen d8, I think, is not normal. Um, and white now has an obvious plan. Black plays queen b6, queen d8, loses tempo. Um, a3 is very interesting. Also stops b5, b4. Okay, makes sense. Uh, bishop b7 is uh, probably not that great. So what he missed is that white attacks the spawn, and if you play 95 here, apparently there's this thing. I think I saw Nordinsky uh, actually look at this line. And there is no time for black because you cannot take the bishop, there is mate. But if you don't take the bishop, this bishop, uh, this pawn is hanging, so 94 here, and uh, queen goes to maybe 3 even. 
and black king is in the center black is also pawned down white has free attack on this guy black is lost so that was probably what he missed um, and if you take on e4 first then queen d4 and then this knight is under threat under attack if you leave then black, white takes the pawn so white is pretty much winning here um, regardless of uh, what happens yeah, so the, this was uh, very strange. So bishop b7 was critical mistake apparently. If you play bishop b7, now you have 95 and black doesn't lose immediately. But his position is still pretty pretty terrible because uh, the, the pawns they start moving here pretty fast, I think. Um, so bishop b7 castles. He plays queen b6, and now you know Bidet actually finds this g4 move. Mm. Yeah, the question is why don't take on d6? And the answer is because black can castle and pin this guy. And if queen f4, um, probably just take him. Yeah. Take, take, take. Queen f2 and black. Surely black is better. Yeah. White has pawn chains and pawn islands, and rook is coming here, so black is fine. Yeah, but the problem is that, uh, yeah, the g4, yeah, this is a problem. Because if you castle now, it's going to be here, g5. And the traditional move knight d7 is now being led by this um, standard pawn, b sack, followed by queen c3. And now black is completely paralyzed. Um, Completely paralyzed, yeah. Knight a7, knight a5 is coming. Uh, bishop a8. I guess it's knight here. And knight a5, yeah. And it's impossible to defend this guy, yeah. Because just straightforward uh, pin usage, yeah. Yeah, so this is a problem for, for black. Uh, this bishop b5, if you can, especially if you castle queen side, this bishop b5 is always a thing you have to watch out for. All right, so, but if you don't play knight d7, then you have to play this move. And this is really ugly, and that's far from the normal. You don't lose immediately, but where do you put this guy? Yeah, I'm thinking like maybe knight c7. And then try it for d5, but even f4, f5, at some point going after this pawn the traditional way looks pretty strong, yeah. Probably king b1 first, make sure this is standard move. Sometimes you want to play c4, prepare this, but also you're avoiding all the checks. And if bishop try like again g6 or something, see, there is this a4 idea, yeah. So that's the point behind king b1. So black plays b4, a5, now you can just play c3 at some point. And then if these rooks are coming here, then all these pieces are gonna hit the black king so hard, it's gonna be a big problem. All right, so um, what happened in the game? Alreza just realized he is strategically lost. He went queen f2 and, uh, you know, the tactical seeking safety in the tactics but Vidit finds this amazing e5 move which is again also pretty standard the idea is that um, if you take bishop e3 queen h4 runs into bishop g5 f6 queen d7 mate so this is the only move and then the problem with this queen like it has nowhere to go yeah boom queen is gone and if you take with a knight, then you lose the queen. So, black must play knight d7. White recaptures the pawn, you know, the pawn trade, this pawn for this pawn. Obviously, white got a much better deal out of it. So, black plays queen b6 to save his queen. After bishop e3, queen d8 again. So, it's kind of amazing. Black plays queen b6, queen d8, and then he goes queen b6, queen f2, queen b6, queen d8 again. 
yeah, this is a pretty much great textbook example on why you know you don't do that stuff in classical games. Um, it's actually pretty good that shows that even the world class grandmasters like Alirizam, you know, they're not allowed to play like this, yeah. And uh, Vidit is just gonna uh, demonstrate how this is gonna happen. Queen d4, okay, I guess. Again, black problem is this bishop and the king, yeah. Like, where are they going? So he plays rook c8, standard move, tries to get the knight here, maybe. Again, the big problem with this bishop. Queen a7, immediately taking. Note of the fact that rook liberated the square, now this bishop has to go somewhere, yeah. Yeah, this is actually like we did capitalizing on every single Alarizan mistake. It's not actually we did outplaying him, he's just giving Alarizan an opportunity to make a mistake. And Alarizan just keeps on charging like a bull at the red color. Yeah, this is this is psychology, man. Bishop b5, and now it's just two extra pawns. And the exchange. Yeah, this is completely lost. This is pure pure self-destruction. Uh, queen c4. I like this move. Queen goes to the c7 location, hits the knight, so black can't even think about doing activity. So queen goes here and rook gets also to the active square. And it's pretty much finally the knight is removed, the pawn is ready to roll. White wins the tempo, attacking the queen. King a2, not sure why, but okay, probably he wanted to avoid check. Bishop d4, and okay, protecting the square before finally recapturing this guy. And white has now four pawns rolling. Black pawns can't even move because, you know, they open the king. This pawn is a killer. d7, knight d4, knight d6, and others are resigns. All right, so he did not survive the opening. This is a disaster tournament for the French player. Um, I think he lost, uh, you know, the will to fight for the candidate spot. He is now kind of depressed. The only thing I can think of is that he must, you know, consolidate and try to, you know, at least score some win in this tournament and worry about his rating, okay? He has to protect the rating. Um, because rating is so easy to lose and so hard to gain. So, and then we have this game. Uh, pretty amazing game, actually. Pretty amazing game. So, Abasov is being shown, you know, how the big boys play. He has good prep. He plays well, but he just seems so outclassed here, yeah. Uh, B3 is very unusual. Wow, okay, so I've never seen this actually. The idea is that white wants to go into the hanging pawn structure. So he wants black to take, hanging pawn structure, and go for the aggressive position, yeah. So that, I, I like this, you know, about this young player from India. Uh, he is playing his first candidates, but he is testing his limits. He, he plays very aggressive chess. And he just tells people, you know, prove me wrong, right? He is really battling, testing his tactics, strategy, opening prep. So, you know, after seeing uh, Prague in action with candidates, we can probably safely say that this guy is here to stay. He is going to be the, one of the world's best players now for a long time. If we go back, uh, like 10 years ago, I think we watched something similar, you know, not even 10 years, like 12 years ago, right? Before Magnus became world champion. You know, there was these two youngsters named Karana and Magnus Carlsen, right? And uh, they've been pretty much dominating in there at that time and showing like they're the most talented youngsters. And now we're seeing this new group of guys, you know, like 14, 13 years later, we have New, new, new group of youngsters that are demonstrating the strength and saying that we are gonna be next. Next Magnus, next Fabiano. Uh, the problem is Fabiano is still playing and he's still 
pretty bloody good, okay? So, but on the other hand, it's good practice for these guys, yeah? They play against guys like Fabiano and they're getting that necessary uh, experience. So B3, grab, grab. And now this is this is actually a surprise because if uh, a boss of new classics, then he knows that in this pawn structure, Black really has to keep this bishop closed. I mean, he probably was gonna put the bishop back here, but then he's gonna lose time. So that's why g6 and playing bishop g7 immediately is recommended. Um, bishop e7, c5. There is a surprise. Yeah, White was saying I'm gonna play king, uh, hanging pawns, and boom, he plays c5. And now suddenly, you know, you realize White wants actually the bishop here. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a lot of psychology again. Um, b6. Yeah, I like this also. Black is not gonna accept the squeeze. Yeah, he's gonna fight it. So he's gonna fight the spawn chain with breaks. Um, and this is actually the best move. Wow, okay. Because after b4, apparently you cannot take with this pawn, thanks to a potential pin. But if you take with this pawn, black plays um, e5 even, yeah. I mean, e5 looks pretty normal now. Pawn, central pawns here are more important than these guys, yeah. So, white takes on b6, queen b6. But judging by the time, both players are more or less in their territory. They know, they have seen this position, yeah. They've seen the ideas, so they know what to play. So that actually makes it more curious. Because uh, it looks like white is better, yeah. Two pawns going here. Providing squares, um, this is weak, but it's easily protected. And white gets more space. So 94, apparently not the greatest move. Black spans 10 minutes. Well, I would, uh, I don't know. Uh, in my days, you know, people usually castle first before you know doing anything here. Probably he didn't want to allow white to play bishop d3 here. Probably, yeah. But after this and e5. You know, things are heating up. I'll probably say that black is very close to equal here. Okay, but Abbas plays knight e4, he wants to um, sort of possibly play f5, bishop f6, create pressure on this guy. It's not bad. So knight a4 with the tempo, retreating with the tempo, very good. And bishop e2, small inaccuracy, bishop belongs on d3 here. More aggressive, but okay, bishop e2. Because both sides complete the developments, black plays bishop f6, and um, he's rushing a little bit, yeah? You kind of also need to do what to do about this bishop. Um, but the bishop needs to be on d7 for sure. Okay, bishop f6, not bad. Um, bishop b3, knight e7, Alehine idea, right? You guys play Alehine, you know that uh, knight has to go here. Attack the bishop. Uh, attack the pawn and also open the file potentially But more importantly bishop d7 bishop b5 is a threat. So you must stop that you must play knight c5 If you don't stop it like if you play like this something silly then Black gets rid of his bad bishop and eliminates your good bishop. Okay now black is completely okay So knight c5 is absolutely necessary at the cost of your bishop though. Yeah, so this is a interesting position uh, white certainly claims a certain advantage because black has, is stuck with the French bishop, has no moves, and there is no way for this bishop to get into the game, which means that uh, black rooks will be cramps and there will be confusion. Uh, one of the ideas for black is maybe sometime to put this knight on c4 or try to get e5 at any cost so the bishop can come into the play. The whole point is, you know, if the bishops come into the play, then, you know, the pair of bishops can compensate for even for sacrificed pawn. In the end game is definitely a draw. So I'm thinking like maybe knight g6 with idea of e5. Uh, to me that makes sense. Yeah. Move like here, consider e5. The only problem of course, you know, white plays this and trades the bishops. But the knight goes here and you can play a5 and e5. Uh, yeah, probably white still better, yeah. Yeah, if white can trade the bishop, it's certainly a problem. So that's why he plays knight e5. 
indirectly attacks the pawn, protects against cushion g5. But the big problem is that white now has a very clear plan. Just push this guy all the way there, thanks to this guy on c5, and uh, black has problems. So yeah, that's why black, uh, that's why black does uh, play e5, tries to free himself, but you know he is gonna trade the bishop, which is probably not the greatest idea. Yeah, first rook d1. Yeah, don't take on e5 and allow uh, the queen activity. So d4. Um, yeah, this is uh, yeah this is clearly that things started to go wrong. So I think e5 is actually a little bit inaccurate here yeah that is a problem the computer says bishop e7 f6 rook e8 prepare for e5 but such patient play is really really difficult to really difficult to envision um i'm thinking again what about queen a7 and like 96 try to get this knight here but the problem again is you know bishop g5 is always a problem yeah yeah so we can safely say that black did not survive the opening he's Worse. Again, Prague's preparation paid off. Uh, he last game he almost crushed Nepal with this prep, and now he's uh, he's uh, got an advantage that Abbasu will find very difficult to um, very difficult to minimize him. Yeah. So d4, but Bishop g5. Hmm. Interesting move. Yeah. 94, 94, 94, bishop h2. Probably white didn't want to allow this, but g3 is possibly a threat. Uh, this bishop has big problems going anywhere. Yeah, but it's not so simple, yeah, not so simple. Queen e4, domination in the center, knights very strong. You cannot take the pawn. The whole point if you take, take. Queen cannot leave because rook is hanging. Rook cannot come here because of the of the um, fork. So black is stuck, yeah? Black has a lot of problems. But okay, bishop g5 makes also some sense. Um, bishop d6, okay. Yeah, I'm just thinking if rook e8, the problem is the rook is unprotected, then you play bishop f4. So you cannot easily hide, the, hide this bishop, yeah? Or protected so bishop d6 g4 first line wow very aggressive but okay it makes sense yeah if the knight goes to h6 you can just take the guy and even take the pawn yeah advantage white for sure extra pawn knight gets squares Again, this bishop is just a tragedy. So black plays h6, okay, and queen e4. All right, again, aggressive chess, but uh, you need to calculate this stuff, yeah? You need to calculate this stuff. Take, take, rook a7, and Abbasa finds the best line. Uh, because now white king is a little bit open, and rook gets a chance to go to e7. Very, very important. Uh, yeah, rook e7, I think rook e7, bishop here, looks much better actually. Because now the bishop, this bishop that I was saying bad things about like half of the game, he's now suddenly got a target which is uh, very yummy. And uh, this bishop on f4 is very hard to touch. Black has potentially g4 thing. This is actually starting to get very double-edged because black can double the rooks, improve the queen. Yeah, this is very double-edged. Uh, Prague started to play aggressive, but um, I don't know if he's correct here. So, rook d4. Yeah, I think knight d4 here is better because knight protects the pawn, threatens knight c6. Nobody cares about this pawn because opening the h file actually favors white. So, but g4 and the idea is that uh, you cannot take this pawn. Yeah, bishop c5, rook is unprotected. But the knight goes here, and oh, black is very materialistic. He wanted that pawn, man. Yeah, if you play materialistic like this, then yeah, then you probably deserve to get punished because um, you give white a lot of tempos, activating the knight. Knight here is great, threatening f6. Okay, 
Uh, okay, he must play queen a5, trade the queens, but look at these bishops again. Again, now this bishop was just when he was, you know, getting some targets, some juicy play. Now this bishop is stuck again, being a very bad bishop. Because no, there is no queen to assist you in attacking this pawn. Yeah, and black goes back. I like f6, I like how Prague plays this. Prague's endgame play is actually very strong. Yeah, I have seen him play endgames. This guy like, really knows ins and outs and um, patterns and everything. He's very, very strong. This move demonstrates it. Um, you cannot like take this pawn because suddenly after knight e4 you have this mating attack. Okay, so big problems for, for black after f6. Uh, bishop f4 kind of prevents the rook g5 check, yeah? All right, rook d1 is okay, but rook h1 looks more to the point, yeah? The point is that you want to double the rooks and go for the mate. That's pretty much the point. Of course, the, the hard thing to see is that after bishop h6, it looks like black is okay, but there is actually this move. And there is suddenly this huge threat of 97 check, followed by rook h6 and rook h8 or something. Yeah, this is a uh, huge advantage for white. But okay, rook d1, centralizing, keeping an advantage. Uh, again, centralizing uh, for this move, yeah, for this move. I was like trying to figure out why you need the rook here. Because he wants to get rid of this bishop and he wants to trade one pair of bishops. That's why. Uh, and you really want to trade this bishop because that bishop on c8 is stuck protecting the pawn, right? So, uh, the point is if black goes like here, then there is a problem. Because you take the pawn with the check. And now white has extra pawn. With a good chances to win this. So black plays g5, tries to protect the pawns and play king g6. Yeah, makes sense. However, uh, oops, yeah, yeah, 94 is probably more reasonable. Just go and grab this guy because after this, king h7, rook a8. Uh, black has a chance now to get an acceptable position if he finds the idea. Yeah. The idea was to play this and rook d2. Because the king is coming. Once the king arrives here, all these pawns are safe. But black has now activity here. There is this threat of g3 and rook also goes behind white pawns, which helps stop them. Okay. So... If you guys been again to my um, uh, Twitch channel for a while, you know my discussions about the end games. Then you probably remember I was always advising uh, for people to consider activating pieces even at the cost of the pawn in the end game because activity is very very important, especially in the end game, especially the king. Okay, because I have a suspicion that Black played here a mistake and Rook F6. Evaluation bar goes like high wear, yeah. Rook f5, and now the 97. A fantastic study like move. Um, the point behind this move is that uh, rook is prevented from playing rook d5, the square is taken, and white wants to trade this rook. And also, rook b5 does not help. The idea is to play rook b7, keep the rook alive, but the problem is that white has this and rook f6. And he hits the rook and the pawn. And this pawn is very, very important. You cannot give this pawn away because then black's double pawns are annihilated. Uh, the, the pawn structure, I mean, is annihilated and white gets the two passers. Okay. I mean, still, you know, there's some work there, but yeah, knight d7, king g7. Yeah, I think bishop c1 was probably the only way to try to to get this working as rook gets access to the f3 square and then if this then you take take 
and this is very likely a draw again. So how would white play here? That's a big question. And the most likely answer is that he's just going to grab the pawn and white has extra pawn. But this is the position where black still can play a little bit, yeah. Still some chances, even not, not a lot of chances, but some chances. What happened, he plays this and he blunders rook a5 and now there is zero chances. White managed to trade the rooks and the pawn is starting to roll because you, you cannot take this rook. Yeah. The bishop has no moves on this diagonal where he can transfer to control this pass pawn. So white pawns queens, wins the game. Black plays king g6, a4, very accurate move. Wins the tempo, the rook is not going anywhere, but white is one more move closer to promoting this guy. So g3 and a6 and bishop e3 runs into knight c5 and the pawn promotes and that's why black resigned. Yeah, again, a fantastic game by Prague. Great opening prep advantage. Then in the middle game, he was kind of shaky. Uh, he went for some complications, which he calculated. But he gave a chance to Abasov, and Abasov went way materialistic. Uh, decided to take back the pawn rather than uh, activate his pieces, and that was his doom. Yeah, he grabbed the pawn on h2 when he had the chance to make an active play. So that was the first moment of being materialistic, and the second moment was when um, he went for this pawn on f6 with the rook. Right, so Abasov, uh, I would say this is actually greedy. Uh, pawn grabbing stuff. I like. I love pawn grabbing. I'm all for pawn grabbing, but I like activity in the end game more. So Abbasov actually made two mistakes in this game, which cost him. The first one cost him the equal position chance to play for, you know, for, to make a fight, uh, a game for three results. And the second mistake was critical and caused his downfall. All right. So that was round six. Um, let's do the predictions for round number seven. We have the game between Alariza and Gukish. And if you guys ever heard the phrase, who is the leader of the tournament most scared of? And the obvious answer and the standard answer is the outsider. <clears throat> outsider who has nothing to lose. He can start playing inspired chess and you know he can kick ass. Okay. This is a classical classical game today. al has nothing to lose. He's got white color. He plays one of the leaders, you know, and there's probably this burning desire in his veins, you know, to go out and show that he he's able to play some fantastic chess, not just being killed like yesterday in this miniature against Vitit where he lost in 14 moves, pretty much. So <clears throat> today I suspect we're going to see a completely different al yeah? Also, today, another critical game, Nakamura versus Nepal. This is absolutely critical pairing because, um, again, we all know Nepal is leading. This is the last round before the stage one is over of the candidates. And everybody goes home to you know prepare for, for the second stage. But Naka is playing white. And if he can actually win this game, he's going to actually catch Nepal. That is how packed the tournament is. I mean, Naka is at 50%, Jan is at plus 2, but again, just one win and suddenly they have the same number of points. So this is the day for Naka to try something, to stop the leader and to assert some of his, you know, chances to win the tournament. He's still, Naka is playing very solid, good chess. He's got a little bit unlucky with Vidit, made a wrong practical decision, even though, you know, he got caught in the opening, but okay, the, the game was equal, but then... Naka got very optimistic and he got punished, yeah? Again, same thing like al did uh, in, 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 yes, in, in the game we just discussed. It was absolutely the same thing and it's also against the same opponent, right? That's what Vidi did to Naka. He, he sacrificed this pawn. Naka's entire queen side was uh, not developed and then Vidi just went for the king with all his pieces, right? And that's the same thing that happened to al -Riza. So you guys see the pattern here? That's what Vidit is trying to do to everybody, yeah? So, so if somebody who is playing Vidit notice this pattern, 
If you break this pattern, develop all your pieces, you're good, okay? You have chances to survive. All right, so critical game. Um, you know, I think Nepo is good, great player, but I think it's time somebody, you know, try to stop him in the candidates. And Naka is the man if he can do it, yeah? All right, next game, Fabi versus Prague. Uh, both players in a good form. And I, as I was talking earlier, Prague is demonstrating amazing chess prep. Yeah, mature, and he's testing his limits. And remember how I was saying like 14 years ago, it was the same group with Fabi and Magnus uh, doing the same thing. And now they play each other, except this is gonna be a critical test for the youngster. Uh, Fabi with white is extremely dangerous. He also knows this is his best chance to try to, you know, catch the leaders and uh, make a claim for the tournament, right? So this is last, I would say, not last, but, you know, critical game for Fabiano with white and also critical game for Prague. If Prague can hold this with black, then, um, then I don't think Fabi has chances to win this tournament anymore. I mean, it all depends on the second round unless he turns up, like, you know, the, the heat, like, by 100%, uh, then it'll be very difficult for Fabiano to compete. Um, I mean, he's still in the leaders, right? But this, this is a lot of critical games today, actually. And we have another outsider against another leader. Not leader, but 50% player. So Vida is on a good streak. Uh, but again, we have an outsider with white uh, playing Vida. But the, the, the thing is here, like, you know, it's actually good for Vida to play black against the Paso because a Paso will probably try to kill Vidit, and Vidit has a chance actually to win another game. Um, hmm. If Vidit wins another game, he gets very, very close to the leaders. So, I don't know. Um, on one hand, like, Abbasco has nothing to lose, but on the other hand, you know, if he loses, then Vidit gets a real chance to, you know, compete for the first place. Yeah. Actually, very interesting run today. All right, gentlemen, that was a recap for round number six. We are expecting a fantastic round number seven today. So uh, I advise you all to watch all these team colleagues who are doing the live commentary. But if you want to uh, learn uh, what I think about uh, today's round, then you will see it tomorrow on my recap. And I wish you have a great time.